Well, good morning, and it's great to be with you this morning worshiping at Grace Bible Church. We're going to continue our worship this morning by reflecting on the death of Jesus on our behalf. And to do that, we're going to be opening our Bibles. So if you don't have a Bible, there's going to be some men coming forward. And if you'd put your hand up, they will make sure that you have a Bible so that you can follow along with us this morning. And I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors leading 414, our college and singles ministry here. And it's just a joy when we get to see the Lord working in the lives of our college students as they, with new independence and freedoms, they encounter new trials, which the Lord uses to actually begin to reveal evidence of saving faith, and that's just a joy, and it's a joy to see them step into the life of this church, not just as recipients, but as co-laborers in the ministry of this church, which is what every believer in Christ does. And I wanted to just remind you this morning that the same truths that must fortify our college students are the same truths that must fortify all of us in our fight to be pleasing to the Lord and and to function together as members of the body of Christ. And this morning, as we prepare for a communion, where we take a piece of bread and drink from a cup as, as symbols to remind us of the death of Christ on the cross, I want to consider two fortifying truths about the death of Christ. And so please make your way to 1 Peter 2. And these are not the only truths about the death of Christ, but two truths that we want to see here and focus on this morning. And the first is that Jesus died as payment for sin. What does the world say about Jesus? Uh, Maybe he was a good teacher. Uh, Maybe he was a good example of how to love. And these things are all true. But if we reduce the significance of the life and death of Jesus to merely being a good example, then we lose the gospel. Jesus died as a payment for sin. And the world doesn't mind a Jesus that merely showed us in his death how to turn the other cheek. But the truth that Jesus died as a sinless substitute to satisfy God's holy anger and wrath against sin our sin, because every person being a sinner by nature and sinner by choice sins against God, and we deserve eternal punishment for our rebellion against him. And that truth, that truth is offensive, but that truth is our only hope, because we can't ever bring anything to a holy God on our own to make amends for our sin against him. Only one was ever able to please him with the perfect life, and it was his son, Jesus Christ, who for that reason was actually able to offer his life as a sinless substitute on our behalf. And we must not lose the heart of the gospel that Jesus died as a sacrifice for us so that we might be saved from sin. So the first reality is that he came to pay for sins, to free us from slavery to sin, and to actually give us life. Give life to everyone who would believe in him. So look down at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Who himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed And for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We who believe in Christ, we formerly strayed like sheep. We sought to put as much distance as we could between us and our shepherd because we loved our sin. But we were brought near, given life because Jesus bore our sin in his body on the cross. Jesus came not just to be a moral teacher or a moral example, but to be a sacrifice for sin. And that's the gospel, and we never leave the gospel. Our college students must cling to this gospel and be fortified by it. All of us must cling to it and be fortified by it. We don't move beyond this. Jesus died as a payment for sin. But the second truth we want to cling to about the death of Christ this morning is that Jesus did die as an example. Look up to verse 21. 
For to this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, who being reviled was not reviling in return, while suffering he was uttering no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And we dare not reduce the life of Christ to a mere moral example, but we also dare not miss that Jesus is our example. In his life and in his death, he gave us an example of how to live in this world and how to live in the body of Christ, to cling to the truth of his payment for sin, but to reject Jesus' call to follow his example misses the very point of the gospel. He saves those who put their faith in him, not just from the eternal consequences of sin, but also from slavery to sin. And he gives us new desires to turn from our sin and the ability through him to actually follow him and live lives pleasing to him. And we can never be saved by pleasing him, but we can please him because he has saved us. So this morning, consider the example of Jesus' death, his enduring hostility and slander and mistreatment, injustice, suffering. Christian, what do you do when we're sinned against? In our workplaces, in our homes, in the church. Look to Jesus who, being reviled, wasn't reviling in return. Do we practice forbearance with one another? Do we forgive? Do we actually aim at the good of those who sin against us? If you're in Christ, we celebrate our new life in Christ this morning as we remember his death. But we also must continue to be fortified by Christ's example in his death as to how to respond when sinned against. And this can't just be on Sundays when we take the bread and the juice, but every day in every interaction, we look to the example of Christ. If we long to be faithful followers of Christ, we can continue to keep our eyes fixed on him, both on his example as we await his future coming. Believer, as you prepare for communion, remember and rejoice in Christ, both as the payment for our sins and as the example for us to follow. And we always want to keep that before us. So consider how you respond to the sin around you, the sin against you. And especially as we're gathered here together as not individuals all remembering Christ's death, but actually as a body celebrating this together, that which unites us, consider how you respond when sinned against in the church. Where have you sinned in retaliation? Where have you sought to take justice into your own hands? Where have you sought to correct someone's wrong understanding of you? Where have you sought to just respond in kind? Uh, there, the temptation in our hearts to do that is real. And we desperately need to look to the example of Christ. So where do you need to repent to forgive to seek forgiveness and follow the example of Christ? Where do you, rather than sinning in return, need to forgive and overlook? And where do you need to step humbly into the lives of others and help them to walk in holiness? Recognizing that we too are all sinners and without Christ, we would all be lost. Men, you can go ahead and come forward and begin passing the plates. If, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, we would just ask when the plates come in front of you that you allow them to pass by. And this is a time for believers as a body to remember what Christ has done in uniting us to himself and to each other. And so we just would ask that you would pass. And Christians, as you prepare your own hearts, um, go ahead and take communion on your own, and then I will come up in a few minutes, and I will lead us in prayer.